So here's the sitch on the ATL box score today. We get into a Braves profiles, players, and play as I finally said it right when we, um, yeah, when we came up with the segment of that show, of the show, I always struggle with that. But anyways, we're talking about Alex Anthopoulos, the Braves GM, just a spoiler alert. And then we have Mike Brumgen on to um, give his thoughts and opinions about the NBA this week with that injury that happened in Portland and um, also talking about who the Hawks could potentially draft. That's at the end of our conversation. So this is the ATL Box Score Podcast with Alex Berger. You're listening to Pro Style, and it is a Pro Style Wednesday, Pro Style Wednesday. With starting a new podcast, people ask me all the time, Alex, where do you record your show at? Do you do it at your house? No, I don't do it at my house um, because of just a lot of different logistical factors. The place that I do it at is actually a place called Spaces Midtown East. And Spaces is a co-working center where uh, I get my show recorded, and I get other work done. Co-working has been one of these new phenomenons in the private business sector that has uh, popped up recently, and um, Spaces also has another brand called Regis, which is more of a professional brand. Spaces is more for creators like myself, but to tell you more about these special brands in the business world is Mr. Steve Choi. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, we absolutely love having you and ATL Box Score as part of our uh, our space. It's always great when we see you doing your work. Uh, but absolutely, Spaces and the Regis concept, we are both workplace providers um, here in the Atlanta area, but all around the world. We have over 250 Spaces locations worldwide plus over 1,500 Regis locations. And what we're really here to do is just provide flexible options for any type of professional, whether you're an independent professional, a creative, or if you're a large or small business. Um, so we have several different types of options uh, from small to large and memberships, part-time, full-time. So definitely come on out and check us out. Um, go ahead and look at the link on uh, Alex's site and um, ask for Steve Choi. And if you ever come into one of our locations, let us know that Alex sent you or ATL box score, box score, and we'll go ahead and set you up with a free five-day test drive. Yeah, you can't beat that five-day test drive. In those five days, you will know if Spaces or Regis is the right brand for you. And um, Spaces is all over the place. Uh, they're a little bit more limited, but they're in the main areas of the city. Uh, the one we are is right in the heart of Midtown, near the Fox Theater. There's one at the Battery. There's going to be one opening up North Point Mall there. Um, and there's also a location in Colony Square. So they are all over the metro area. At just about any major business uh, building in the Atlanta area has a Regis in it. So um, just Google them. And, but, but Spaces and Regis... And Steve Choi, in particular, is your place to uh, do your business. Welcome back, welcome back, friends, uh, to the ATL Box Score Podcast. And I just first have to say, my morning commute sucked. Did yours? Mine was pretty good. Yeah, because you just, once you get on 75, it's pretty much automatic. Yeah, the Sith Infiltrator. Yeah, once I get on the train, it's kind of automatic for me. But it takes a while to get to the train. That sucks, buddy. Yeah, I had I even tweeted about it. And this is my first time where I did like a angry tweet. Angry tweet. And, and I hope that you realize that it's like I'm not angry. No, but you because got stuff I, on your mind. Right, I got stuff on my mind and stuff. And 
yeah, I hope I never come off as an angry person because I don't like those people that use Twitter for like the evils. You know, yeah, there are people who use Twitter to bully other companies or services or people to do their bidding, and I don't believe in that either. I was either I was trying to come up with a um, I was trying to come up with a tweet that uh, or a hashtag, yeah, hashtag that said hashtag stop being stupid. <laughs> nice. I mean, that kind. Of, I guess that to to a certain crowd that could come off mean or something yeah, like that. But I mean, here's the thing: the difference between what you and I do when we tweet our experiences, we're just saying, "Hey, I'm frustrated, and here's why." There are people out there who are trying to gain something, like the people who say, um, "If you don't do this, I'm gonna tweet and continue tweeting." Right? That those are the people who are like, "Oh, come on, give me a break." Right. Right. Well, that all ties in to what I want to talk about, the first thing leading in, because, like I said, I do take the train almost every day right. into work and stuff like that, and the train is super convenient. Um, and yes. I'm it's pretty using, awesome. I'm using, Marta, I'm using Marta train and saying super convenient. It's super convenient when it works, it works, because then you can just pass by traffic and everything like that. What I noticed yesterday was... That on, because uh, you know, like they'll have like big advertisements. Uh, there's there's an advertisement like on a couple of Marta cars for the Atlanta Falcons and for a random like, yeah, random bank or wh- whatever. You know, you know, like the, the train advertisements. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen sure, it before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The banners. Right. Well, well, some of them take up a whole car. Nice. Uh, so they wrap it. Yeah, yeah, a couple of cars. Um, so they have one for Atlanta United. Okay. And just the color scheme of Atlanta United and the way they did this on the train looks authentic communism. (laughs) That's what it looks like. And if you've ever seen the movie, maybe I'm dating people right now, showing my age a little bit like that. If you've ever seen the movie James Bond, Goldeneye, or you've played the video game, and you got to that level where you're on the train, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Like, it, I mean, it kind of looks like the train you saw Kim Kim Jong Un. Uh, what is his last name? Uh, Kim Jong Un. I know this is never going to be. Uh, his, technically, this, his last name is Kim. This is never going to be recorded. I mean, this is never going to be heard in North Korea. So I feel confident that I'm kind of just having a tongue twister with. Right. The North Korean King, president Kim Jong Un is in Korean. Their names are their surname is said first, and then their uh, first names are said last. Interesting. You learn something new every day. So, anyways, it looks like that type of train, especially now, because the color obviously the color scheme is red. And um, black and gold, black and gold, and now you have that star on top of it. I know that probably that star means that you won the MLS Cup, and and that's what that represents. Mm, I think that's just their. They have. They always had a star in their logo. No, they never had a star. This is like the first year. Okay, because it has like eighteen. If you like, you look uh, into the I star gotcha. and everything like that. I gotcha. Okay. So, so I think that's for the the world. Cup. Put that on the comment section because I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. If you know what that star represents, if it, if it is winning the MLS Cup or it means something else, put that in the comment section. If you're listening right now. So yeah, with that Marta trains right now, kind of it kind of has that authentic communist look to it. Because before that star came around, I mean, it kind of looked like, it kind of looked like a German kind of look and feel to it with the logo and the, and the color scheme and everything like that, and and it seemed like they were trying to make everyone happy with combining uh, Tech Gold with uh, Georgia and Falcons uh, color scheme, the red and black color scheme. Right. But but now it just. Now it looks I really need to see this. I'm super curious now. I want to see what this train looks like. If you guys have pictures or images of this, of the Marta, go ahead and uh, tweet and comment. Put it in the yeah, comment put section because I'm super curious what it looks like. ATL box score on Twitter. So if you if you know what we're talking about, it's gonna be hilarious. Um, so did you feel did you feel some kind of way riding the? Or were you on it? You were you on one that had a wrap on it or? 
No, I wasn't, but I just saw it like passing okay. by once. I was okay. like, wow, that looks like authentic communist. <laughs> did you have to did you have to like paint yourself? Like did uh, you did you slip into another dimension? No, no. I mean, like actually it's kind of cool the way like like cuz they have these stripes mm-hmm. and they have like all like the writings of like um like different neighborhoods and, and different mm-hmm. places and I've seen that before. I think that looks cool. Mm-hmm. But it's like if you take a step back and you're just like Whoa, this kind of because yeah, with the stripes that. and everything yeah, like that, and yeah. then it's like they have like the state of Georgia and gold, and it has seventeen on it. I don't nice. know what that means, but it's like I'm just like, man, that looks very like communist Russia, authentic communist, yeah, authentic, huh? authentic like back in the '60s, back off of James Bond, Goldeneye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know you. I know you've at least. I know you guys have at least played the game on uh, N64. <laughs> So, anyways, what <laughs> one of the things I've been that wanted did date you, buddy? That dated you hardcore, right? We're moving on, buddy. Anyways, by the way, I'm Alex Berger. Alongside me is uh, Steve Choi. Uh, yeah, put that picture. If if you've seen pictures of that, put that. Uh, share that on our Twitter. We were ATL Box Score on Twitter. So, one of the things too I wanted to talk about was. Um, the different commercials that I saw during the uh, conference tournaments, and they're still kind of relevant. Um, the ACC Network commercial, whatever they're doing, like it just looks awesome. They have this like old school kind of grainy look to it, and the way the cinematography, it just looks really cool. If you haven't seen it, nice, and. They actually make like the Duke like hand waving thing look cool, and the the key thing from Virginia Tech they make that look cool and everything like that, and and just the way like the, the those commercials look, I, I I gotta hand it to the ACC people. This is like the first time the ACC ever looked attractive. <laughs> I mean, the only time that the ACC looked attractive is when they were like you pin something to them on with uh, Food Lion. Because mm. there was food involved, mm. which, by the way, actually, my dad actually worked for Food Lion nice. back in the day. So, the other thing I liked, and I think you're gonna like this one, buddy, was the Boost Mobile commercial. Okay. I have no intention of buying any Boost Mobile products. What's wrong with Boost, buddy? It's just not my style. I think they're a subsidiary um, of T-Mobile, maybe. Because mm-hmm. you know, a lot of these like Boost and um, these other smaller mobile uh, companies, it's just a it's just a uh, a ruse because they're actually part of the larger companies like Verizon and Sprint, but they have to have their little small version so people can think that they're getting a deal. Right, right. But anyways, I think I, I mean I thought about you when you said I thought that. about me. I huh? thought about you. Okay. And I'm gonna try to keep this G rated. Okay, G rated. Um, but. That one commercial with the with the family um, that they um, yeah it was Boost Mobile and obviously you know who they're trying to advertise to mm-hmm. and the father of this family because it was like a family of like a wife and uh, a husband and I think like two or three kids mm-hmm. and. Um, it was a thing where they flipped the switch and everything because they were like glitching and everything like that. And the father says, oh, no more resting glitch face. <laughs> nice. And this year I actually found out what, I mean, because I've never heard that expression before. You didn't before. know where that came from, huh? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Minus minus the glitch. We're just going to put it that way. Minus the glitch, yeah. but the face, but the blank face. Yeah. You resting something face. Resting something face. Right, the yeah. resting something face. Yeah. Like, I just heard that this year, and I was just like... That's a very real thing, buddy. Right. And then I heard that, and that just cracked me up, because I yeah. know... <laughs> yeah. I know that it's like... I know that it's... Yeah, I You've know... You've seen that on people, haven't you? I have recently. So, so, I some think of, I have a resting glitch face. I don't... know. you don't. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, you don't. Those commercials are awesome. I, you know what my favorite commercial is for those like mobile stuff or cable? What's up? The AT&T uh, internet one where they're like, 
somebody's um, it's like two parents and they're talking to their son or daughter because they have two versions and they're like oh i'm going over to so-and-so's house and they're like what you're not going over there and what do we tell you and then they're like why their internet baby it's bad they got cable <laughs> oh yeah i've seen that i've seen that it's yeah so hilarious like we, we raise you better than that to go over people's houses with cables or internet i'm concerned about that yeah i remember that i remember that Oh. And my last thing, and this is going to tie into actually what we got next coming up on the show with uh, some Braves profiles, players, and players. Well, actually, this time we talk about uh, players. Some players. Some players in the front office. So, with yeah, uh, with that, I like, and I know you've seen this commercial. I know you've had to see this because you watch a lot of local news. The Atlanta Braves new commercial. Which one is this? I've seen a couple. The one um, where it shows Freddie Freeman like with the bats on yeah. a pile of bats. Yeah, yeah. You show Ozzy Albies, which I thought that was super creative. Yeah. You you saw so yeah. I just thought it was super creative that you had Ozzy Albies with a bag of bases like he just stole and just get you ready for um yeah just get you ready for baseball season. I mean. The Braves commercials in the past were okay, but I feel like this is the best one I've seen so far, and that just kind of rolls us into uh, Braves profiles, players, and players. And this time we got a good one for you. By the way, too, uh, just a shout out to the Deutschland, uh, Germany, because we've had like 12 listeners from there. For some reason, some reason Germans seem to like us here. Uh, they like listen to a podcast that's about Atlanta professional and college sports. For some reason, so shout out to Germany because they've been they've been our strong listeners out there. I don't know why. And I guess I guess Germany is a place where you can speak fluent English. But I, I've heard differently though. But anyways, uh, this is the ATL Box Score podcast and. Um, I'm Alex Berger. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment if you like what we uh, talked about so far. I know it's kind of been like a uh, random, uh, all over the place type of type of feel. Like, uh, or or maybe I I feel like it's it, that that conversation was more like a just a hangout, two guys talking. But we're gonna get into the nitty and gritty because we have Mike Brummagen on. But first, we're gonna get into Atlanta Braves players and players. Well, depending on when you're listening to this, if you're listening to this on a Wednesday, this is a Pro Style Wednesday show, and pretty much have a pro lineup, uh, we're getting into some Atlanta Braves talk, our uh, Braves profiles, um, players, and players, and depending, like I said, depending on when you're listening, the season has already started in Philadelphia, or it starts tomorrow. Man, I can't believe it starts tomorrow. It just, wow. After Valentine's Day, man, that just went downhill. That went so fast. But anyways, now we're going to talk about, because we talked a lot about in this segment, a lot about players that play on the field. We haven't gone to the players yet. The guys in the front office. And the guy that's most well-known in the front office that a lot of fans know about. And obviously you're going to, to have your opinions and have your, your, um, and your doubts and everything like that, which is baseball fans. I, I feel you're, you have the right and you have the, the opinion to, I mean, you have the right, right to do that. But we're going to talk about the GM of the Atlanta Braves, Mr. Alex Anthopoulos, which this is his second year in a four-year contract to be the Braves GM. He was with the Toronto Blue Jays over a decade, in, ca- in case you guys didn't realize. Um, that that was pretty much where he grew up as a um, in the front office with player personnel and then uh, got to be GM there. But, I mean, he was there from 2003 to 2015, 
which is a yeah that that's that's a heck of a long time and in that time period too he he knew how to wheel and deal even though he hasn't really shown that yet with the Atlanta Braves because the only big trades the the, the only big uh moves that he he's made in the in the off season so far is the 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 Culberson and Brian McCann getting Brian McCann back and and getting uh Culberson in here now I'll get to that in a moment but I feel like the reason why the Braves really like him because with the Blue Jays he was all about the farm system yeah he knows how to wheel and deal he's got gotten a lot of good talent gotten rid of a lot of a lot of talent to other places to get more talent in there but at the same time he's a fan of the farm system which for people that don't understand the Braves organizations the Braves pride themselves on the farm system in the minor leagues drafting guys developing them and then the cash out is that they become yeah that they become big stars like the most recent one has been Dansby Swanson who's had his success and also Ronald Acuña and that's why the Braves honestly was probably that's why we were in a rebuilding season for so long because we had a lot of young talent that we drafted but it took them a while to come up into the minor leagues and it takes them a while to develop as um, major league ball players. It's just the growing pains of baseball. And the Braves, for a long, long time, long, long time, I mean, was all about the farm system. And that's why we're sticking with Alex Anthopoulos. By the way, too, I know it's kind of off the rails. But the grid players that came out of the Braves' farm system were guys like Chipper Jones and David Justice. Just saying. It works when it works. But we're in a society right now that's very, very impatient. But anyways, back to Alex and uh, Thopolis. Now, with the reason why I feel like they um, got Colberson. I feel like Colberson is going to make the Braves organization better. I don't think he's like a superstar type of um, guy that they got that's going to erect the program or erect the... Um, <laughs> or... Yeah, yeah, be the superstar type of talent. But I think he's a guy that could pro- probably take you to the next level. He's the guy that I feel like is going to put you over the edge. And I feel like the reason why they brought back Brian McCann was the fact that they needed veteran leadership. And I talk about more Brian McCann in the uh, last podcast. If you want to uh, check that out, I forget the name of that podcast in particular. I'm... Um, but, I'll, yeah, I'll get it to you at the end of the segment. So, anyways, if you want to hear about the Brian McCann stuff, my thoughts on Brian McCann. So, anyways, with the Braves, even though he hasn't made any, any big-time deals, I feel like Alex Anthopoulos is the right guy right now because he's making smart moves. Bringing Culberson into the club is a smart move. Getting Brian McCann back is a smart move. Where the Braves are right now, if you would, if we would kind of talk about where the Braves are right now, what they're relying on is a lot of young talent. A lot of young pitching and a lot of guys, the, the guys that are experienced are the guys that could get you good at bats. Young pitching and just i just feel like the Braves organization the the Braves right now from players organization is just young right now and it seems like they're comfortable enough with that 
that they're comfortable having a young team. They're comfortable having a lot of young arms. And they're also comfortable with having the veteran guys be the guys that uh, step up to the plate and, and could possibly, like Freddie Freeman, could possibly uh, get you out of something. Or with Ozzy Albies or, um, or with whoever. But they're comfortable with their veteran leader. I mean, they're comfortable with their veteran leadership not being in the bullpen. Because I really do feel like if the Braves, and I don't know what their cap is, because I don't like to get into the the, 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 the numbers of of uh, salary and stuff like that. I know you got guys like Endurance Iarte who's uh, making a ton of money. Um and also some other, uh, I'm, I'm assuming Freddie Freeman's in that same category. But at the same time, I feel like if the Braves needed to make moves to be successful, they could have done it. Just and, and I feel like there's no reason why Atlanta is not a attractive place to, be, to play baseball. This is a very attractive city, first of all. Because it's 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 constantly growing, so I know like baseball guys uh, that are on the free agent market. This is an attractive place. You have a new um, you have a new stadium that's been around for two years, two or three years. It's yeah, it's going on its third year. You have a brand new spring training facility. So there's no reason why I don't think that uh, this place is attractive to. Um, to baseball players, and I think they would be they would know how to move the money around to get guys, and and they're comfortable where they are right now. But I think though Alex Anthopoulos coming into this Braves organization is just a relief because you had I mean because it went from John Hart pretty much tearing everything down, taking a sledgehammer to the clubhouse and getting rid of. Uh, your Jason Haywards, your Craig Kimbrels, uh, your guys that uh, could possibly get you to the postseason, but they just didn't pan out. They, it just wasn't a good fit. You got rid of those guys. Then you got John Capel. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm I, I'm, I'm screwing this up. Uh, Capelera, who it was just, I mean, ran a program you thought you thought was better than John Hart could. Can make more moves. Wanted to wanted to wanted to build back uh, the program or the the clubhouse, I should say. That's more of a baseball term, the clubhouse. But he did things that it's like you saw at SMU in, in the SMU football program back in the eighties. That was just really out of character. I mean, just really what the Braves organization wants to stay away from. With all the payouts and the with with international players and and giving them free stuff and 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 money on the table that that the Braves didn't want it, like the Braves organization didn't want to touch. So you had that craziness going on. Now you have Anth- Alex Anthopoulos, which I think he's the right guy, and I hope I hope he stays around for a while because you had John Sherholtz. For forever. I mean, I think since like from the 80s all the way to like um, 2005. You had John Sherholtz forever. In, in And and that was the reason for the success of the Braves. Because you had a long-term GM. And we've seen in baseball, long-term GMs work out. They just work in professional sports. That if you stick with a guy, if you, if you're, let me put a word out that we're not used to in this day and age. If you're patient on how they develop. Yeah, I get that you had a guy like Frank Wren. Frank Wren should have gone a long time ago. But I'm saying, guys, be patient with Alex Anthopoulos. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to wheel and deal if he has to. And I think it's going to be good. I think the Braves are set up for a really great future. They have the facilities to back it up. The only thing that I feel like you need to get rid of your GM for is if he does something crazy like John did. 
Capoeira, not John Hart. But I'm satisfied right now going into the season, and maybe I'm just one of those guys. Because, I mean, I'm not one of those guys that likes to complain or likes to find things to complain about. Uh, I'm one of those guys that, that, that I'm content on who's in leadership unless they're extremely shady, which he doesn't seem like a shady guy. He seems like a player's guy, honestly. He seems like a guy that wants to see the Atlanta Braves be successful. Even though, like, I know a lot of Braves fans were kind of just wanted to see a lot of big moves this offseason. But this is what you got. So, Brandon, hope you enjoyed this segment. This was a long Atlanta Braves players and players and the profiles of them. But, um, but yeah, now we're going to have to figure out a creative thing, creative way to talk about the Braves in the podcast because we're going to end the series. I think I might talk about Brian Snicker just for the heck of it. That might be the next one, but um, who knows? <coughs> we'll we'll get into our think tank and uh, think about it when we come up with our um, show notes and 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 our show meeting. So, with that being said, Alex, even though he has the same name as me, which I like it, I even like that last name, Anthopolis. Sounds like some sort of Greek philosopher or Greek god. Maybe he was. Maybe there was an Anthopolis in, in in Greek mythology, and he was over player personnel. Well, with that being said, it's I'm glad baseball season is back, and we're going to see him against the Phillies tomorrow or today or whenever you're listening. Or hopefully, if you're listening towards the end of this week, we're not, we're not in a we're not in a hole. We're down down two games um, to one, or yeah, down two games. So. So with that, yep, that was uh, our Atlanta Braves. Uh, our Atlanta Braves. So right now, we just want to bring on our NBA guy from CNN, from CNN Sports, Mr. Mike Brummagen. Mike, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Are you, are you over that um, illness that you were um, that you had the last time? I wish. I still have a lingering cough. Oh man! Um, although I, I'm not sure if it's still the bronchitis or, or it might just be allergies now because pollen is everywhere. Right, right. Yeah, I noticed it like on a, on a car coming in this morning to work. Then I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's that season. Two days ago, the pollen count was in the thousands. Whoa. Yeah, it, it's actually dangerous. Like one of those days where the According to the pollen people, the, the allergy center, they, they say that you shouldn't be outside for more than five minutes. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. But let's talk about your favorite subject, uh, which is the NBA right now. And it just seems like that there's a lot of drama going on, which there usually is around this time, getting close to playoffs the um, since the college basketball tournament, our college season is winding down and and uh, March Madness usually loses their luster around this time so this is the peak NBA season and um mm-hmm. what are your thoughts so far on um just league round uh um on um the play uh, of 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 the games that are going on and um and just your thoughts real quick on um this time of year where people are trying to push for uh, the playoffs? Well, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, you got a lot of teams jockeying for position within you know the top eight in each conference. Um, some of those are really interesting. Uh, and then, you know, for the most part, uh, like the West is pretty much decided. Right. Um, the only team who hasn't been mathematically eliminated from the playoffs – in the West is the Sacramento Kings, and they're five and a half games back with only seven games left to play. So, uh, you know, well, they got eight games left to play, but still, you know, that's that's not a lot. Yeah. You know, you're five, five and a half games behind the San Antonio Spurs, who have won seven of their last ten games. Like, you don't look like you have good odds of, of trying to squeak into the playoffs. But the thing that's really interesting in the West is that you got – Golden State and Denver, 
was playing tug of war for the the top seed um and it's it's interesting because it's almost like golden state perhaps wants to lose their way to the second seed to try to avoid the spurs who are currently the eighth seed um because the spurs have been really hot and the spurs play them really well they match up real well um and they're very well coached so you know like the and the reason why I say this is because Warriors have lost four of their last ten, you know, whereas, you know, the Nuggets have won eight of their last ten. So um, the the Warriors at one point, you know, had a stronghold on the first spot. And, you know, over the past week, the Nuggets have tied them, tied them up for the top seed. So, right. um, you know, they're jockeying up there. And it, it, it kind of feels like, you know, maybe the Warriors are strategically trying to because they don't really need home throughout because they know they're that good. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for them, it's a, you know it, it, it might make sense that it's a, a strategic, uh, em, you know, employment there for them to try to play with the standings. You know, may win a game here, lose a game there to to you know drop a seed or or go up a seed to make sure that they get a matchup that they prefer in the first round. The interesting thing is the Thunder are also losing. Right. And um, it to the naked eye, if you're just watching their games, it looks like they're it really just looks like they're just losing. But <laughs> you never know. Maybe they think that they can match up well with the Warriors, so they're trying to drop down to the eighth seed so that they can play the Warriors in the first round. Who knows, man? It's just it's crazy all over the place, and you got. Currently, the uh, number three seed is the Portland Trailblazers. They've actually won four straight, um, but they they got a rough a rough stretch ahead because they they just lost Yus- Yusuf Nurkic injury. I know we're going to talk about that later, but that's that's going to hurt their uh, their chances of of holding that three seed over the Rockets, who are only one game back. You know, and then you got the Clips. The the Clippers are in fifth, surging so. The, the Blazers could potentially go from being third seed, dropping all the way down to fifth or even sixth. So um, that middle section of, of the standings in the West is really tight. It's a difference of two games between third and, and sixth. Mm-hmm. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the last seven, eight games of the season. In the East, um, you know, because the bottom half of the East is pretty much not that great across the board you you actually have more teams still vying for playoff spots um because the eighth seed presently is the magic and their record is 37 and 38 which means they're actually below 500 but that also means that they're only you know (laughs) only a couple games ahead of the miami heat and charlotte hornets who are the ninth and tenth best teams in, in the east so you still have two teams who have a legitimate shot of trying to catch up to the Magic and overtake them. But also the Pistons are trending down. The Pistons are currently seventh, but they've lost four of their last six, lost three straight. So potentially the Heat and Hornets could try to jump the Pistons and the Magic. But the Magic have been playing really well lately. They've actually won six straight. So I, I think they'll probably trend up to hop over the Pistons. Uh, they could make a run at the Nets because they're only a game behind the Nets right now. Uh-huh. So you could see the Magic surge up to the sixth seed. Um, they're not going to get further than that because everybody in the top five has significantly better records, has you know about seven games on them. But uh, they could jump up to the sixth, and you could see either Miami or Charlotte wind up jumping from out of the playoffs into the playoffs over the Pistons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a pretty tight race at the bottom in the East right now. Mm-hmm. Um, For an Atlanta podcast, and we've had you on since the beginning of the year, we talk way too much about L.A., but still, there's a lot of drama that has gone on with uh, L.A. and uh, recently, because you're, you're in favor of uh, Luke Walton. Am I? 
No, no, I mean, you're in favor of Luke Walton. Uh, you didn't let me finish my thought. Uh, you're in favor of Luke Walton um, and the Lakers going their separate ways and getting a new head coach. And, and right now, um, there are rumors of um, Jason Kidd being the next Lakers head coach. What do you think about that, and, and what's your opinion on that? Well, I mean, you look at the – you look at what the what has happened this season, and granted, they've had a ton of injuries, and injuries have definitely soured their prospects. They likely would be in the playoffs if it hadn't been for injuries, especially the injury to LeBron. But when you, even when they're healthy, when you <laughs> when you look at Luke Walton's coaching, you look at what he's done with with his lineups, with his lineup adjustments during games. Uh, his out of timeout plays. You look at, you know, the totality of everything he's done from last year to this year with the young guys. They, like from last year to this year, there hasn't been a lot of marked improvement. You know, not a lot of development under his watch. So, does he really deserve to keep his job? You know, I just want to start there. But as far as the rumors, you know, first. He has to get fired. We'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll right. put that there. Can't hire anyone else until he's fired. Um, but if if Jason Kidd's in the running, I think that's a fair a fair stab in the dark. You only got there's not a lot of like really great coaches available unless mm-hmm. you try to trade for one, which that's going to cost you a first round pick, maybe a first and a second. Um, so that'd be very expensive to try to trade for a really good coach. <laughs> you could try to take a stab at, at a really good coach from college, but that's a risk. Right. You know, they they don't always pan out. So, and and the other thing you're looking at is if you're going to pick someone to come in and coach, you already have the smartest basketball mind on your bench in LeBron James. So you have to get somebody who he's going to respect. Not just, you know, as a basketball person, you know, like obviously he would respect Jason Kidd for his accomplishments. He's a Hall of Fame player, but he has to respect that person's mind, you know, his basketball IQ. And Jason Kidd is one of the smartest players who's played this game. As a point guard, he was a, a consummate floor general. He, he was an on-court coach, like so he knows the game from an from an intelligence standpoint. Like he knows the X's and O's, he knows the plays, he knows the sets, he knows how to work offenses against certain defenses. So that's somebody that definitely I could see LeBron actually having respect for if they decide to go that way. Um, you know, of course, Ty Lu, who was LeBron's coach when the with the Cavs when they won their championship, he's also a name that's in the running because he's currently unemployed. Um, but whoever they go for, it's going to have to be somebody that can step toe to toe with LeBron on a, on an in intellectual level when it comes to basketball. And it's going to have to be somebody who can command, not just, you know, ask for it, but who can command LeBron's respect. Mm-hmm. Cause if, if LeBron doesn't, like, honestly, when you look at Luke Walton, what, if anything, is there about Luke Walton for LeBron to really respect? They they were in the same draft class. Think about that. They're, they're, they came in the same draft class. Luke retired before LeBron. Luke accomplished nothing that LeBron accomplished. I mean, of course, he got got some championships riding on Cody's uh, Kobe Bryant's coat coattails, but that's that's not because he was great. He was a, a role player off the bench. You know, LeBron is been the greatest player in the league for the past 10 straight years so like the the trajectories of their careers even though they're in the same draft class are going two completely separate ways and what is there about basketball that luke walton could know that lebron wouldn't yeah yeah Nothing, nothing the only thing that luke has going for him is he's the son of a hall of fame player right so He's not somebody who who you know you could really look at and say, yeah, that guy would really command the respect of one of the best players who ever played the game. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And it's... and that's not to say that 
you know, that's not to say that LeBron has been disrespectful to him or, or mistreat him. It's just that he's not someone who has the acumen or the the accomplishments to command LeBron's respect. Tyloo um, is Tyloo has a, a relationship with LeBron. They're, they're friends off the court, so that's one thing that he has going for him, um, and that's why they were, were able to work well together in Cleveland. Also, Tyloo, similar to Luke Walton, has some championships from his time in, in Los Angeles. Um, he, just like Luke Walton, was a, a role player, but he's he was able to earn LeBron's respect because he knows the game and he was able to to manage their team um, and manage the egos and manage, you know, the roster in games and help them to win a championship. So um, that's there's a difference there between him and Luke Walton. There you go. <clears throat> now, talking about the injury that was probably heard around the world with uh Yusuf uh Narkic. I mean that was like that was like a tree going down in the forest. Like that made a sound when that 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 tall fellow went down. Um dude you you didn't even have to, I mean I, you could see his leg break. But right. you didn't even have to like if you hadn't been paying attention to see it when it snapped just the the visual like the live as it's happening response of the opposing players, like all the players around him wearing black jerseys from the Nets immediately turned around and, and walked away with like just shock and disgust on their face because of how gruesome the, the break was. Yeah. That's, that's that immediately like just seeing their reaction tells you how bad it was. And, um, I, I feel bad for Damian Lillard. I think about this. Lillard, uh, point guard for the Trailblazers, was on the court playing with Nurkic at the time that Nurkic's leg snapped. Nurkic had a compound fracture. Tibia, fibia, both broke. Now, rewind time some years back. U.S. Team USA practicing in Las Vegas. Damian Lillard's on the team. Paul George is on the team. They're both on the court. Paul George's leg snapped. Lillard has witnessed the same injury to two different guys on the court in his career. Same injury. He's been on the court both times. He was on the court with Paul George when his leg snapped, and he was on the court with with his teammate Yusuf Nurkic the other night when his leg snapped. It's... uh, Man, that, that, that's really unfortunate luck, and that that's gotta like kill you as a, just as a person to see other people hurt like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I was just surprised at the noise that that made when that guy went down. It was literally yeah. like a tree falling in the forest. Yeah, it made it made a I mean, at least two bones snapping in half. Like, it's gonna make a loud kind of crunchy snap. It's, it's just, it, it hurt. Like, yeah. I've had knee injuries and, and other leg ailments, you know, so, like, I haven't had a break like that, but, like, it, it made me cringe, and it made me feel pain for him. Like, it's, it was bad. Yeah. What do you think <laughs> his status is going forward? Uh, is is he out the rest of the season? Because it seems like it. And... Oh, God, a compound fracture? He's, he's just going to take him, like, a full year, if not longer, to rehab. Wow. Um. And you figure his, it took Paul George about a year to come back from his leg injury, and then it, it took him a whole another season to get to where he played like any resemblance of himself. So it's 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 an injury that's going to take a long time to come back from because you you need your legs a lot in basketball. You run a lot, you jump a lot. Right, right. And then think for this guy, it might take even longer because he's bigger, has more weight, carries more weight on his body and on his frame. So. Um, it could potentially take longer for him to come back. Right. <laughs> the, oh, the positive thing, this is what's positive, uh, or the silver lining. If, it, if ever there was a silver lining, the silver lining for him is 
he just signed his extension this past off season. Mm-hmm. So he got his money. He it's not like he was in a career year and oh crap is is you know that's what happened to DeMarcus Cousins last year. Right, right. Cousins Cousins was on a career uh, on a contract year when his Achilles snapped, and so then he had to settle in the off season for significantly less than what he's really worth because people weren't sure how he would recover from from the Achilles injury. But fortunately for Nurkic, he already signed his extension, so he's already got his money. So now he just needs to focus on rehabbing and getting getting back up to health. And as we've seen with Paul George, people can come back from these compound fractures. Uh, it just takes time. So it's it's going to take some time for him to get back and and be himself again. Uh, and, and it's sad because he was having a career year, mm-hmm. career high in points, career high in rebounds. You know, just. Uh, doing really well I mean heck in the game that they were playing double overtime game game against the, the Nets which they won he had what, like 32 points and 16 rebounds or something like that um, he was playing phenomenally well and and the tragedy is maybe that injury doesn't happen if they don't go to overtime yeah 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 there's always that what if scenario but the positive I when you brought the positive thing up about it, I thought it was, I thought it was going to be the next thing we're going to talk about. But that's good though that that he has that financial security, uh, especially yeah. for his family going through that because that's a lot of medical bills. Um, one of uh, one of the things that that was kind of touching and kind of like kind of make you tear up when you think about it is like uh, Damian Lillard was talking about it, and he he said that you know just two days prior. Um, Nurkic came, you know, unannounced to his house just to be able to visit his baby boy. Like, oh, he wow. has a, a little baby, and his teammate showed up just to be able to visit his kid because he want just because he wanted to see his kid and, you know, be supportive. Wow. And and you know, took a picture of himself with Lillard's son and posted to Instagram. It's like that's that shows you like the the kind of familial relationship they have as teammates and kind of makes you feel even more for him with with everything they're going through mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but on a positive note though um which you told me about the story which i thought was pretty interesting uh tony parker who plays for uh the charlotte hornets actually uh because they played the spurs recently with his old team mm-hmm. and he actually got on the flight back with the spurs because uh one of his friends is um his Jersey's going to retire. So, uh, tell us more about that since uh, you found the article. I mean, it's it's a, pretty much as simple as you said it. Like they, the Hornets, who are you know trying to fight, as we said earlier, talking about playoff positioning and stuff. The Hornets are pretty much trying to fight to stay alive in the in the playoff hunt. Just a couple games back, so they really need to win. They're playing the Spurs, and they eked out a win over the Spurs. And after the game was over, instead of staying in Charlotte with his team or going home to, you know, his rental house, or I don't, I don't know that he bought a house in Charlotte, but, you know, if he has a house there or not, you know, instead of going to his Charlotte crib, he hopped on the flight back with the Spurs so he could come back to San Antonio and be there for Thursday, because Thursday the Spurs will be re- retiring men in Ginobili's jersey up to the rafters. That's really cool to hear about yeah. that. Um, yeah, and, then, and it's really uncommon uh, you'd hear you'd see that, but I mean it's Tony Parker, like, mm-hmm. like he, they, they he had the keys like, to the what, city. Three so, together? Yeah, exactly, exactly, and the man had the keys to the city, so so that's also really cool, and also too. Chris Bosch, um, his retire his, his number, a former Georgia Tech player, uh, his number is actually going to be retired for the Heat. Uh, actually, it was. They they just put it up in the rafters last night. Nice. So a lot of a lot of jerseys being retired, and um, I mean, I can't believe Chris Bosch is totally <laughs> done. I didn't know he was he was coming up in age like that. It's not that he's up in ages. He had to. Retire. He was forced to retire because he has a because injury, a, blood, a yeah. blood clot injury history. Um, if if he had kept playing, there was a risk that he could wind up dying on the court. Dang. So he had to forcibly retire. 
Um, the team wouldn't – he wanted to play for a while, but the team would not let him play because yeah. they didn't want to take the risk. Yeah, because of legal and stuff. And... Eventually he came came around and he agreed. You know, he realized, you know, staying alive, being able to be there for his kids and his family was more important to him than, you know, trying to continue to pursue basketball. Mm-hmm. So uh, – but uh, but yeah, he he definitely deserves to have his jersey put up there. He helped help Miami get to two championships. Um, they went to four straight finals, won two of them. You know, and he even before he got to Miami, he had a really good career in Toronto. He put up really good numbers. He's a a definite first ballot Hall of Famer. So uh, you know, he deserves it. Mhm. Mhm. Uh, yeah, that's good to hear. Um. Good to see too, especially from a um, former Georgia Tech player. So um, that should be like a point of pride for the Yellow Jackets because I know they'll probably have him in his um, in their basketball facility somewhere. So, um, but before we end this conversation, um, a lot of buzz right now is um, all around uh, Trey Young, and I feel like people around here are just trying to find a positive thing that they can latch on to uh, because of the way this season was just terrible, but right now they're actually winning a lot more than um, that's really they unexpected. Won, won three straight? Yeah, they won three straight. So, um, But your guy for the, for the um, Rookie of the Year award is obviously Luka, and, and, and the stats are showing it. Like his productivity yeah. is just through the roof, but I I just want to get your opinion on what do you think of this like this this kind of local bias uh, to uh, Trey Young? Well, and it's it's recency bias. That, that's the way I put it. I think I think for most of the year, up until around you know a couple weeks after the the All Star break, I think even people in Atlanta would agree that Luka Doncic was bar none the the rookie of the year like it was his to be had um but then after a couple you know just within a couple weeks of the all-star break you know then you you start having some phenomenal games from from trey young you know he had you know 40 point game a couple 30 point games it is a stretch a three game stretch like two 30 point games and a 40 point game in that stretch um and then suddenly you know it's just everybody start jumping on the trade bandwagon like oh my gosh this kid's phenomenal and not to take anything away he is great he looks really good and he can only get better right but but even with as well as he's been performing for the last half of the season the only thing he's doing better than Luca is he's over the last half of the season he's been scoring more and gets more assists right but Luca Luca across the board is you know, in every metric, a better player, especially when you look at the entire season. The totality of the season, Luca beats Trey Young in practically every metric, except for points and assists. You know, and it's hard to argue against that. And even defensively, uh, Trey Young has been a liability. He actually accounts for a negative win share, mm-hmm. like almost negative two win shares defensively, where Luca is actually positive. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, it, that that's not good. And then when you look at their their team output, Luca plays for the Mavs, and he's pretty much all they got now. Yeah, yeah. Because at the trade as a trade deadline, they traded away every other good player that they had to try to make the team better for the future, um, which doesn't help them now. Yeah, yeah. And, and so he's a one man show. And over in Atlanta, you got. Trey Young playing with John Collins, who's having a sensational sophomore season. We talked about that last week. You know, his sophomore year, he's putting up really solid numbers, 20-plus right, right. most nights. <laughs> also, he's got, you know, other rookie, Kevin Herter, putting up some solid numbers on occasion. He's been inconsistent, but every now and then you get a, a 20-point outburst from Herter. And you got the old man... Vince Carter putting up numbers, you know, mm-hmm. even at his age, mm-hmm. you know, 15 plus every now and then. So, you know, he has a better supporting cast, yet 
the Hawks have a worse record than the Mavericks, and the Mavericks play in a better conference. Explain that. If he's so yeah. much better than Luka, why is his team not doing better than Luka's and they play against inferior competition? Yeah. That's so a good point it, right there. And, and and that's the thing. Like, when you look at – when you really look at the bodies of their work and you compare them side to side, like, the people who vote on these awards, they, they look at the totality – of the season and they look at everything these players have done. They're not just going to look at the things that are happening in the most recent weeks or games. They're going to look at everything. And that's why Luca is going to win the award. Um, Trey Young is, is definitely played a phenomenal second half, uh, but he's still very, very inadequate defensively. Uh, he has not improved defensively in the second half of the season. He's just gotten better offensively. Um, and that, that to me also hurts his, his chances, but, um, but defense is something he could get better at in, in the years to come. You know, you can always improve your defense. I don't think he'll ever be a amazing defensive player. He's never going to be like in the running for defensive player of the year, but he can always become average or, or, you know, adequate at defense, which is just going to help him overall as a player as he grows. Uh, but you know, kudos. You know, he's he's making Atlanta, you know, and making the fans, you know, not regret the trade. Yeah. Because yeah. for a while, a lot of people were like, you know, even I, I, I bemoaned it at times. I was like, man, look, man, they should have kept Luca. They, you know, and <clears throat> to me, um, I still kind of feel that way but to me like it it really is going to depend on what they do with the draft pick that they get mm-hmm. because Dallas did give Atlanta a draft pick that's only protected for the top five and either they're not going to be in the top five right so right we will have Dallas's pick this year so we'll have two lottery picks this season so as long as we make a smart decision with that pick mm-hmm. we could come out the winners of the draft of the right. draft trade from last year. Two things with that. You, you gave me two thoughts right there. <clears throat> First of all, with Trey Young, do you think like the goal for his development is to play a complete season from a standpoint of because because he he had a slow start, and a lot of people aren't going to blame him because it was his rookie season. But but the expectation now is that that what does this kid look like? Um, going forward with a complete season, can he put up these numbers consistently? Because even you saw at Oklahoma. Oh, he I had... definitely think he can. I think – I think. what the thing about this is his style of play is actually more suited to the NBA style of play. The NBA is more open. The floor is more open. The, the court is actually bigger. And, um, you know, the style of play in the NBA has become more acclimated to the three-point shot. And, you know, it's, it, you got more stretch bigs spreading the floor out and making the court more open. So uh, his style of play is, fits that perfectly. He can shoot the three, and with it, with the floor being more spread out because there's more people who can shoot, that means he has more space to try to create and take people off the dribble, try to get to the basket, create for himself, draw a foul, or be able to pass off the teammates. So um, when you look at what happened in Oklahoma, you know, the the – college style of play isn't the same as the NBA style of play. And so, right. you know, pe- people can, the floor, the floor is smaller. You got more, more people trying to play a traditional type of big man type of basketball. But my point you know, was like, with that, it's like his, his play dropped off at Oklahoma. It was hot at first. And then as the season went on, it just dropped off. It dropped off when, when you getting into tournaments and when you're getting into tournaments you're playing against better teams better teams usually have bigger players and they play more physical that's not how the nba plays that's Mm -hmm. that's that's the point i'm making Mm -hmm. the drop off is explainable by the style of play and college play isn't the same as as nba pro play the floor is more wide open so his style of play you know it's more sustainable at the nba level than it was in college because gotcha gotcha the the floor is more open uh, so I think I think you know this guy's the limit for this kid. I think he can only get better. You know he can only continue to improve his jump shot, make it even silkier, smoother. 
I think, you know, he can continue to improve other aspects of his offensive game. But also I feel like, you know, as he tries to work on improving his defense, his footwork, that's just going to make him a better, more well-rounded player. And, um, you know, those are the kind of things that are really going to make Atlanta fans really clamor to go to games and pack out the stadium, which hasn't happened in ages. Yeah, yeah. Now you talked about the draft and that Atlanta could potentially be in a really good position with the draft. Yes. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's actually like, I, while I like seeing that, that, you know, Trey and, and the guys are having fun and that they're, you know, being competitive and winning games. At the same time, I want them to lose. <laughs> I want them <laughs> to lose. So I want them to improve that draft stock. But, um, right, you know, right, right. I it mean, is what it is. I mean, what you talked uh, about with, with, with filling out the stadium, when, when this team is hot, the city will get behind them. Yeah. But, but when they're losing, uh, no one, that, no one has a lot of interest. Sucky. That's what sucks, though, is, like, it's fair-weather fans. Yeah. You know, a lot of the fans are fair-weather. You know, it's like in other cities, you know, the Celtics could be hot garbage. They're still going to pack out that stadium. The Knicks are hot garbage. They still pack out Madison Square Garden. The Lakers are hot garbage. They still spell out. You know, like, teams who have storied history and have, like, you know, really good fan bases, like, they pack out. But in Atlanta, and I think part of it's a lot of the fans here are transient fans. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's hard to get diehard Atlantans to commit to, you know, filling out the stadium when, you know, we're not putting out a good product. Yeah. And that's that's unfortunate. But it, but um, it's also good to see, too, that uh, that the support will be there. Yeah, that people yeah, will rally. Eventually. People will, because, I mean, when, when we had this going on uh, a couple seasons ago, like back in... Um, 15, I was surprised how many people got on the Hawks bandwagon, um, really mm-hmm. fast. Now all it takes is winning. Yeah. yeah. Look at, look at, uh, you know, look at the Atlanta United. Yeah, exactly. Their first year, they, they had a couple attendance records and they wound up making it to the playoffs. They didn't win at all. They got what put out the second round or whatever. Right. And then they set, they come back their second year and they set an attendance record practically every week. Yeah. And yeah. and they went on to win the championship. Right. The you know, it it just takes consistently winning. Yeah. Or consistently it does. being competitive. It does. Um and for me if I were going to prognosticate and try to look to the future, I think I would give this team three years, uh, you know, well, including this year. I'll, I'll give them, like, another two years because, you know, they're they're mostly young. They need development, and it depends on who they're going to draft. But, like, for me, if I'm their general manager, what I'm looking at is, first of all, I'm crossing my fingers and praying to the basketball gods that, you know, we look up in the lottery. Yeah, we, yeah. We have pretty good odds. Um, they changed the lottery rules so that the top three teams all get an equal percentage. They all get 14%. The next team gets 12.5%. Next team gets 10%. <laughs> Currently, the Hawks sit fifth worst in the league, which mm-hmm. means our our percentage chance is 10%. Yeah. You know, so... We're not that far off in percentage chance of winning the lottery from the worst teams in the league. Yeah. 14 to 10% isn't that huge of a gap. So we have a chance. We have a chance. And if we don't win the number one overall pick with Zion Williams, we could still wind up in anywhere from second to fourth. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. And the thing is that we also have that Dallas Mavericks pick right and the map the mavericks currently have the six or yeah they currently have the six worst record mm-hmm. so so we're looking at we could have our pick be in the top five and hopefully as well as the mavericks don't wind up with a top five pick we yeah. get their pick yeah so if their pick is like six or seventh or eighth that's still fairly high in the in the draft if we wind up with like anywhere from like three to five with our pick, and then theirs is like a six or something, mm-hmm. this this 
this draft is deep enough that what we could do is we could entice somebody and be like, hey, we really want Zion. Take this number three pick and this number seven pick and give us the number one pick. Well, or or if the number one pick, if that team was like super sold on Zion, they didn't want to give up, give up the number one, we go to the number two and be like, look, all right, talk to us here, Phoenix Suns. We'll give you the number three or four pick, whatever we have, and we'll give you the number six or seven pick from the Mavs. We'll give you two top ten picks this year for the number two, and then we take R.J. Barrett. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That is what I want for the Hawks this year. I want to see us get lucky and get some good positioning, still be able to keep the Mavericks pick, and then maneuver via trade to get move up and get either of the Duke boys. Interesting. I was going to say, too, um, what's your thoughts about John Morant? And uh, there's also <laughs> a wing great. player on He's Texas great. Tech that uh, it seems like the Hawks could potentially get a, a guy like that. Well, uh, John Morant's great, but we don't need him. We we have Trey Young. He's a point guard. John mm -hmm. Morant is a point guard. But it seems I like you can put him – you can – Put him in anywhere because the guy seems he, no, super no, versatile. He's a high, no, he is a high usage type of guy. He needs the ball in his hands. Trey Young needs the ball in his hands. We don't need that. We need we need somebody who can play off the ball. Zion Williamson can play off the ball. R.J. Barrett can play off the ball. We need guys who can play off the ball because we want the ball in Trey Young's hands. For as good as Morant is, he's not the passer that Trey Young is. Trey Young is a phenom passer. Mm-hmm. So we want the ball in his hands because we know he's going to make really great passing decisions. So while I, I really like watching John Morant play, I I don't think we need him because he's a, he's a point guard. He's only six three, so he's he's not that huge to be able to play, you know, off the ball in the NBA. You know, like he's he's not going to match up well against guys like you know six six shooting guards. Right. Yeah. You know? So I I feel like his best his best trajectory in the NBA is going to be a point guard, like he's been where he's at. Um, and we have our point guard. We don't need a point guard. We need someone who can play a swing position, play off the ball, and uh, be a killer. You know, off the ball. That's what we need. Gotcha. And if we can trade up and get R.J. Barrett or Zion Williamson, I'll be over the moon. That's that's what I want. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thank you, Mike, for uh, being on uh, the show today. That's all the time we really have in this segment. But I uh, appreciate you coming on uh, every week and um, sharing your um, NBA thoughts and opinions and knowledge. And really appreciate it. A-plus effort today. Um, where can we reach you at on uh, social media? At Imbromagen on Twitter. Gotcha. Well, cool. Well, thanks for uh, being on the show, and I uh, hope you feel better, buddy. Thank you, man. Have a great one. All right. So now we just want to thank Steve Choi for joining the show. Is that Are you eating eggs? Boiled eggs. Boiled eggs. Okay. Eating those boiled eggs. And uh, Mike Bromagen for coming on the show. Oh, man, that smell. Yeah. I want to also thank Mike for uh, coming on the show today the a little smelly than i than i uh, anticipated in a closed off room gotta open this door when we finish recording uh but anyways uh sad news well not necessarily sad news probably it's probably good news and bad news at the same time depending on uh if you're a dogs fan and what you uh what you do for the um cocktail party because the Jacksonville landing is actually um yeah they're they're the city of Jacksonville has voted to demolish that area which was kind of like I mean it was kind of like underground Atlanta shops bars a place to party type of type of thing place to get mugged? probably too I mean, I mean, that's that that's a place that it's like my parents wanted me and my brother to stay away from. So, just to put it that way, 
I mean, I'm pretty sure it was like uh, Underground Land. It was cool at first, and then it's like it just got creepy really fast. But anyways, they're demolishing that whole thing, and I'm assuming they're probably going to build something back up that's going to be like that, like what they're doing with Underground Atlanta. Um, so I'm assuming they're going to... Because that, that's prime real estate right there in Jacksonville. So... Yeah, sad day if you're if you're a dogs fan because I hear that's when the dogs win that's where the the fans go to 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 celebrate and to uh, do other things after that. But um, probably a good thing and a bad thing at the same time <laughs> that that place is uh, totally closing down because I've never been there before. I've been to I mean I've been to the, to the Florida Georgia game, never been to the Jacksonville Landing, but that just that just probably sounds like a place that was cool during the 80s and never kept up with the times. So with that being said, uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the ATL Box Score. We are on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever good podcasts are found. I'm stealing that line from my uh, good friend, uh, Lawton Child. So be sure to check us out there um, and you finally made it. If you're listening to us in traffic, um, yeah, hopefully you're just getting through it like Steve was stuck in traffic yesterday. So um, thanks for checking us out. This is Atlanta's newest sports podcast. Uh, by the way, check out the show description uh, in case you want to uh, see the notes or, or or even a link to, to help out this podcast because we are uh, right now just uh, financed by donation so if you're interested in that be sure to check out the links uh also too if you want that i forgot to plug the 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 15 percent off yeah you get a 15 percent off if you use co- if you use promo code alex when you come in to tour a spaces or a regis that's all that's a that's a 12 month deal uh if you sign up for 12 months if you get a um, if you get a co-working space like a desk or something like that, or if you get a private office, if you're if you're in the market looking for a private office, you get 15% off when you go in and tour Spaces or Regis. Use promo code Alex. And if they don't know what they're talking about, tell them to talk to Steve Choi. So, um, so yeah, use promo code Alex when you go into Spaces and Regis, and that'll be a good deal for you going forward to to uh, either change the locations or to start your business or or whatever you need uh the office space for so check that out uh check out spaces and regis um at spaces office works i don't know the the website for regis off the top of my head but uh yeah glad that uh we could get you guys through the um through wednesday now it's hump day now now everything should probably go downhill for you uh with your work day so uh, enjoy this time. I always like when you make it to this time of the week where, yeah, it just seems to go by faster than you think. So with that, take care of each other and, uh, and yeah, go Hawks and, um, let's hope we get those, let's hope those grand picks fall on the ground and, um, continue on this winning streak. With that, episode 44 is out.